Question and answer period. Continue to continue to film during the question and answer. Yes. Um. I guess it's hard because you, you only see the back of people. But um, I'll I'll probably go up to sit in. Good evening. Tonight's speaker is known for his work on the body, and as he often mentions, the body as an object, not an object of desire, but rather an object that requires redesigning. His work explores alternate anatomical architectures, interrogating issues of embodiment, agency, identity, and the post-human. Mark Derry described him postmodern incarnation of the archetypal image of man. He has traveled abroad on more than a dozen large scale projects exploring the corporation of body and machine. He has performed with a third hand, a stomach sculpture, an exoskeleton, a six legged legged walking robot. He designed internet performances that explore remote and voluntary choreography via muscle stimulation system, such as pink body, parasite, and fractal flesh. He is surgically constructing a stem cell growing an ear on his arm that will be electronically augmented and internet enabled. 
with the rewired remixed performance for five days, six hours a day, he could only see with the eyes of someone in London, hear with the ears of someone in New York, while anyone, anywhere, could choreograph his exoskeleton arm. In 1996, he was made an honorary professor of art and robotics at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, and in 2002 was awarded an honorary doctorate of laws by Monash University in Melbourne. In 2010, he was awarded the Ars Electronica Hybrid Arts Prize, and in 2015, he received the Australia Council's Emerging and Experimental Arts Award. In 2016, he was awarded an honorary doctorate from the Ionian University in Corfu. Stellar is currently a distinguished research fellow, School of Media, Creative Arts, and Social Inquiry in Curtin University. Whilst Skolt Livesey Galleries in Melbourne represent his, his artwork. I heard Stellar for the first time a few years ago in Cyprus, and I remember living at the end of it with an extraordinary experience. Then I listened to his talk again a year later in Venice, and I realized how differently my perception changes every time I learn more about his work and recognize more and more layers. <laughs> or the good always. Together with the support by Masters in Live Arts and Performance Studies, Masters in Ecology Contemporary Performance, Program in Lighting Design, Fine Arts Academy, Alto University, Bio Art Society, and Tiden Edistamiske Schools, forget my Finnish, the visit of Stellar to Helsinki became possible to successfully inspire all of us. Stellar will prove today that curiosity and innovative thinking can lead to miracles in production. Welcome to you all and the ones that are with us with, uh, through live streaming. And please join me to welcome Stellar. Um, well, uh, firstly, uh, thank you, Nicolina, for the excellent introduction. And um, uh, I will be sort of introducing some uh, other kinds of research during this presentation that are not my own, but I think are useful in getting us to uh, rethink the idea of, of the body. increasing video virtual and, and vicarious world uh, the body tries to reassert uh, its materiality it's it's not a site for the psyche nor for social inscription but for me becomes a site that needs to be sculpted uh, the body is not an object of desire it's an object that requires redesigning and so this body is interactively operating now in a flattened ontology of other bodies, machines, microbes, objects, and algorithms. The suspension performances begin as a way of exploring the physical and psychological limitations of the body, uh, but they're not meant to generate any kind of meaning. They're not performances that explore any kind of transcendental or shamanistic pursuit. <coughs> So they're not seen as rituals, rather the suspension performances are, are in fact uh, performances of affect, of intensity, of, of, of experience. Um, the body counterbalanced uh, by a ring of rocks. Uh, this performance ended when the telephone rang in the gallery. 
um, the body in a uh, spinning, uh, seated and spinning position. Um, I guess the realization during these performances is that the body is a very vulnerable, soft uh, body, a body that can be fatally infected by microbial life, it can't see, it can't feel. Um, its survival parameters are very limited. And in this technological terrain of very fast, powerful and precise machinery, the body realizes its radical obsolescence. Um, this performance was uh, one in which the body was suspended vertically uh, from a gantry crane. And with a control box, the body was able to choreograph its own uh, movements through the space. Um, at first, everyone thought it was just going to be an up and down um, performance, but in fact, the body could propel itself forwards, uh, backwards, sideways, left and right. Um, there was a, a barking dog and a crying child in the audience, which added a, uh, some ambience to the performance. Uh, but uh, I also discovered that if I stopped suddenly, stopped and started suddenly, I could generate swinging, which was an unexpected uh, part of, of, of the choreography. And uh, this performance um, really begins when the body hoists itself uh, off the ground, and the performance ends when the body lowers itself down. Uh, performance in New York over East 11th Street, um, four stories up. Uh, the body had a good view of the police cars that arrived within about five minutes. Um, I was in fact arrested, not for performing an act of nudity in, uh, you know, in, in the public area, not because I performed some sadomasochistic action, but rather that I was a danger to the public. Uh, you know, had I fallen on someone, uh, it might have uh, caused a, a fatality. We now know that we can preserve a cadaver indefinitely with plastination. And we can display uh, uh, cadavers in ways that we couldn't display them before. But at the same time that we can indefinitely preserve a cadaver, we can also indefinitely sustain a comatose body on a technological life support system whilst cryogenically preserved bodies await reanimation at some imagined future. So it's really a time where uh, dead bodies need no longer disintegrate, near dead bodies need no longer die. Um, you have a situation where uh, your body can have a continued existence, even though it's dead. Uh, so there's a blurring of what's living, what's dead, what's partially living in, in the lab, for example. The process of approximately one year to ensure that he met the true criteria to be the right patient for this transplant. And sure enough, he did meet this criteria. At that time, we described a procedure which would essentially restore everything which was not functioning and appearing normal on his face, which included portions of the scalp through the forehead, the upper lower eyelids, the nose, upper lower lips, soft tissues of the chin, down to the level of the neck, and the underlying structures, which included the upper jaw, bones around the eye sockets, the upper teeth, the lower teeth, as well as the anterior portions of the tongue. Dr. Rodriguez, uh, he suffered a, a gunshot uh, accident back in 1997. Uh, uh, amazingly, his, his sight wasn't affected. His, he still had his vision, but as you say, he, could, he can now uh, smell something he probably hasn't been able to do, what, for, for 15 years. He is, he's now talking. Uh, tell us about uh, the moment that, that he was able to do these things. So the, the face from the donor body uh, stitched to the skull of the recipient becomes a kind of third face uh, resembling neither. So this is very much a time of, of circulating flesh where faces can be exchanged. We can take out, we can extract an organ from one body and insert it into another body. Uh, we can take the hands from a cadaver and reanimate them on an amputee. I, fir I first saw the first double hand transplant at a medical conference in Paris. 
and only after six months uh, he could uh, move his cat of the fingers. He had a rudimentary sense of pressure, uh, texture and temperature. So uh, the idea of circulating body parts uh, becomes uh, plausible. And also the, the blood circulating in my body today, if you're O positive, might be circulating in your body tomorrow. But as well as a time of circulating flesh, it's also a time of what I call fractal flesh and phantom flesh. And by fractal flesh, I mean bodies and bits of body spatially separated, but electronically connected, generating recurring patterns of interactivity at varying scales. Effectively, that's what happens on the internet continuously by everyone, everywhere at any time. And by phantom flesh, I mean with the increasing proliferation of haptic devices, uh, then increasingly uh, our phantom bodies become much more uh, potent with their presence. You not only will be able to see and speak um, over the internet, but you'll be able to have some kind of force feedback, some kind of, 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 of texture uh, feel. We now can tissue engineer parts of body, parts of a liver. Um, so we can radically repair the body. We can inject uh, stem cells, heart stem cells, into a damaged part of a heart and they, uh, that, that heart muscle will, will regenerate. So pluripotent stem cells now can radically repair damaged parts of the body. Um, and another interesting thing that's happening, as we can uh, engineer things at a molecular, cellular level with tissue, um, John Rogers at the University of Illinois has been developing um, flexible circuitry. Uh, circuitry that uh, can be stuck to the skin, uh, that is disposable after use. I'll just play the, the video from, from that for a moment. A team of scientists led by University of Illinois professor John Rogers has created a new, less intrusive way of gathering data from the human body. Unlike conventional equipment that hardwires patients to a stationary machine, the epidermal electronics, as they're called, attach to the skin in the same way you would attach a temporary tattoo. Our thought was that if you could convert the electronics from the rigid boxy form that exists today into a format that looks like the skin in terms of mechanical properties, uh, shape, uh, stretchability, toughness, uh, then you could almost make like a second skin that would laminate on the surface of the uh, biological skin in a completely seamless, integrated fashion uh, that would be essentially invisible to the user, but able to deliver all of this kind of new functionality through the skin. So this circuitry can be deformable uh, and still operational and effectively you can stick these circuits on your skin and wirelessly transmit uh, body signals for example or use body signals not for medical reasons but as control signals for operating uh, various devices. So in instead of the circuit being made of rigid lines it's made of these curvy linear lines which means uh, the flexibility allows it to be uh, stuck on any, any part of the skin. Uh, recently he's also developed biodegradable circuits. So if the circuit is printed on, uh, on a silk substrate, if it's printed in magnesium and if the insulation is silicon dioxide, you can stick this for example on the surface of a heart uh, and then three or four weeks later, after it's done its monitoring, it can wirelessly biodegrade inside the body, harmlessly biodegrade. So as, as well as being able to, to function at that kind of uh, uh, tissue culture and stem cell uh, uh, level, um, now flexible and, and micro-miniaturized circuitry um, is, being, is being developed. Um, the third hand was the first um, uh, uh, augmentation of my body. Uh, this was completed in 1980. <laughs> and uh, at, the at the time it was um, <clears throat> sophisticated enough 
to get invitations from the Jet Propulsion Lab and the Johnson Space Centre in Houston uh, to uh, demonstrate this to the extravehicular activity group. Um, it has only three degrees of freedom, a pinch release, a grass release and a 300 degree wrist rotation. But the interesting thing is that it's actuated by electrodes on the abdom abdominal and leg muscles. So you have independent movements of, of the three hands. Originally it was just simply a, a visual attachment to the body uh, for performance, uh, but then this is uh, writing with three hands, uh, one, one word, uh, had to keep your two eyes on uh, the sequence of letters that you were writing, and uh, because this performance was done on a sheet of glass between the artist and the audience, I had to learn to write it back to front. Uh, only learned to write two words, evolution and decadence, because these were both nine letter words. Um, a performance with the third hand, but it, in this case, um, uh, amplified body signals and sounds, heartbeat, blood flow, brain waves, muscle signals, um, were amplified. So the sounds that you hear uh, will be the amplified body signals and sounds, and we redirected lasers through optic fiber to the eyes. So by moving the muscles around the eyes, you could literally scribble images uh, in the space. And this performance began when the body was switched on. <laughs> And the performance ended when the body was switched off. As the body performed over a period of hour, it fatigues, uh, the, the sounds sort of indicate uh, the condition of the body uh, during that one hour. So these projects and performances are really about uh, alternate anatomical architectures. Um, it's not about enhancement, that's a value judgment anyway. Uh, it's about experimenting with the possibilities of additional body parts, mechanical or otherwise, um, and seeing what's possible in terms of your operation in the world, in terms of your performative possibilities. Um, the extended arm is an arm that extends my right arm to primate proportions. So it makes it a very long arm, and he here it has 11 degrees of freedom. But whilst my right arm is extended, my left arm is computer actuated uh, with a, a, a muscle stimulation system. Uh, 15 to 50 volts of, of electricity contracting the muscles. So once you program the movements, the arm is performing continuously, uh, repetitively. Uh, and this performance was for four hours, I think, four hours. Um, and uh, uh, the sounds that you hear will be sounds from uh, sensors, uh, flexion sensors, proximity sensors, and ultrasound sensors. The body was actually performing with the streaming video image uh, that was being generated and we had also constructed a 3D model of the mechanism which mimicked uh, the movements of the, of the extended arm. Um, so online, if you were watching, this is, is in 2000, online you would see not only the video streaming but you would see the, the 3D model uh, uh, mimicking the movements of, of the mechanism. Uh, uh, this was performed actually in Avignon. Um, I'm sort of going backwards, uh, but logically it's forwards, because it didn't take much imagination uh, to, 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 to figure out that if you could uh, program the body to, to, to uh, perform involuntarily uh, with muscle stimulation in a local space, you could do this remotely. So this is the muscle stimulation system. The blue switches indicate which muscles could be programmed. 
you plug your laptop in, you could program a sequence of movements. Um, and using the touchscreen interface, by touching uh, the, 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 the uh, 3D model, uh, the 3D model performs what you just uh, programmed. And then, in this case, a second later in, in Luxembourg, where my body was, uh, my body moved involuntarily. So, uh, people in the Pompidou Centre in Paris, the Media Lab in Helsinki, and the Doors of Perception Conference in Amsterdam, and this was in 1995, so it goes back a bit, um, were able to remotely access and remotely activate the body in Luxembourg. Uh, with the head-up display, you could see the face of the person moving you, and there were malicious agents out there who, not believing in the system, would program the same movement over and over again, and because this performance was for six days, uh, no, sorry, two days, six hours a day, uh, it still was quite fatiguing. <coughs> Ping body, in contrast, was not people in other places, that were making the body move, rather internet data. Uh, ping signals uh, to 40 global sites, the reverberating signals measured by the host computer in milliseconds and mapped to the muscles of the body, to the musculature of the body. So the body here becomes or moves uh, as if it's a kind of crude barometer of internet activity. And with Parasite, we we actually customised a search engine to scan the internet, select anatomical images of the body off the net, display them to the body. Those images are measured in terms of their complexity and the more complex images simply generate more active movement and the simpler files, the simpler JPEG files are generated um, uh, less active movements. What's interesting here too is that I had sensors on my arms, legs and head. So the body here is also the video switcher and the video mixer during the performance. There was a kind of an aesthetic surveillance system of, of cameras uh, positioned around me, above me, and as my arm was moving involuntarily, as my head tilted up, as my third hand elevated, uh, this triggered um, the switching of the, of the images and the mixing that occurred that was projected uh, above the body. Um, and uh, we did amplify sounds, but again, the sounds were from signals of the moving <coughs> limbs of the body. Okay, so in this age of mixed realities, the body performs literally beyond the boundaries of its skin and beyond the local space that it inhabits. It extrudes into these non-places of virtuality and the body experiences itself as its phantom. So to others online, we appear flickering on and off as a kind of digital noise, as, a, as kind of glitches in biological time. And it's this excess that generates a radical emptiness. So by extruding the self, in a sense, you kind of empty the body. And, and so even in, in, a, in a time of excess, um, emptiness is, is, is the outcome. A 3D printed um, uh, 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 orthosis, either for a paralyzed hand or for uh, a, a, a robot controller and a design for an ambidextrous arm. So imagine if the fingers could bend one way, if the thumb can rotate um, ar around, you would have a right hand, but in this case the fingers can bend completely the other way, individually. Uh, the thumb can rotate backwards. So you have a left hand and a right hand all in one, a kind of universal human manipulator. Uh, I mean, if you were an amputee, why only get a replacement right hand when you could have a hand that's both left hand and right hand? I'm sure there'd be some tasks where two right hands or two left hands uh, would be useful. 
Um, so you can see this precise position control and uh, flexibility because this was actuated by a, 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 a bundle of pneumatic rubber muscles. So the arm is, is, is compliant. As well as uh, manipulates, I've been really interested in locomotion. Uh, I've been interested in insect and animal um, architecture. And in 1997, with the help of F-18 in, in Hamburg, we constructed a six-legged walking machine. Um, this was robust enough, strong enough, to uh, hold uh, my, my body. Um, I could select the different walking movements of the robot by making different arm gestures. So the upper body exoskeleton with position orientation sensors allowed me to uh, select the legs from my arms. And um, this was also a, a sound machine as well as a, 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 a motion system. Um, only one performance uh, of this occurred in Gallery 291 in London. It was never really finished to my uh, satisfaction, but effectively this was a, uh, if you can imagine, uh, a five meter diameter robot. So five meters, Five. So in diameter, so it's a very large robot. Um, this robot had large rubber, pneumatic rubber muscles, uh, and it was a gallery 291 was a converted church church space, but it was the only space at the time which was sort of large enough that we could perform in it. And the idea of this performance, uh, which was realised in a limited way, was if you lifted one leg up three robot legs lift and swing forward. So by stepping up and down on the spot, you could generate some movement. And uh, you could also turn on the spot. Um, so this performance was really uh, one in which um, your bipedal gait is translated into a six-legged walking locomotion. Uh, a smaller robot, two meters in diameter, Imaging a, a, a human head, uh, it has a rotating ultrasound um, um, sensor on the front. If it detects someone in, in the room, the robot stands, selects from its library of possible movements, performs a little choreography, and then uh, when it's finished, it sits down, goes to sleep, and waits for the next person to come along. It's a loud robot. <laughs> of this was a kind of an actual virtual interface where the mechanical movements would modulate the facial expressions. Uh, a project that hasn't yet been realised. There's been a couple of projects that haven't been completed. Um, we've made several attempts to engineer this but the small scale has made it difficult. It's a six-legged <coughs> robot with a webcam mounted on its, on its tail and it's small enough and robust enough to climb up my tongue and into my mouth. I just have to be careful not to swallow. Um, it is a gesture as to the increasing intimate uh, relationship we will have with our machines. Uh, in fact, one can argue that in the future, all technology may be invisible because it'll be inside the human body in nanoscale form. In 2000 years time, we may look exactly like we do now except that our bacterial and viral populations will be augmented by nanoscale sensors, nan nanoscale machines. Uh, from a medical point of view, we have no real adequate early alert warning system that something pathological is happening at a cellular level. So sensors that might detect changes in chemistry, 
temperature blockages in our circulatory system and enable uh, us to be alerted, uh, this would make it possible to target and eradicate the small cluster of, of cancer cells. At the moment, by the time you feel the symptoms in your chest, um, the cancer spread, the cancer has mis metastasized. More excitingly though, we might consider that the body, body could be redesigned atoms up, inside out, by, by these nanomachines. Uh, you wouldn't see, you wouldn't feel, and you wouldn't know of any changes because they would be happening so incrementally, so gradually. Um, so the idea of redesigning the body, atoms up, inside out. It's very difficult to redesign the body an organ at a time. Um, it's an analog body, but an atom at a time, a cell at a time, a molecule at a time, that, that's exciting. Um, the three <coughs> ideas uh, that, that I, I talked about this morning, uh, Bruno Latour's actor network theory. So the idea here is <coughs> that you, you know, all, the, all the actors, whether they're human, in, you know, non-human, uh, or, or objects, they're all treated equally. And this does away with kind of in essentialist qualities. The qualities that an actor has in a, in a, in a Bruno Latour actor network theory are being generated by the network of relations. So your, your differences are due to your relationships in the network. And I think this is an important idea. And then the other idea, uh, uh, Graham Harmon, uh, object-oriented ontology. Uh, in other words, the, the human is not considered uh, the primary um, uh, object in, in an interactive situation. Um, the, it's a kind of flattened ontology where microbes, machines, uh, bodies, um, other things, other objects are all equally important and of course the internet of things because as we continue to embed a circuitry into our objects uh, objects become smarter objects can be online objects can communicate um, and you can remotely activate objects uh, in your home for example um, uh, when when you're here or there so uh, I think these three ideas um, are interesting to consider in terms of um, the increasing uh, artificial intelligence and robotic and, and very powerful computational systems that are now being uh, developed. There's a, a new generation of robots now being developed. Um, I saw the, the, uh, this kind of robot at Case Western Reserve uh, uh, University at the time, uh, before the Penn State one. Um, but this combination of wheels and legs that they call WEGS enables the robot to move very fast on a flat surface, but also enables it to clamper over uh, obstacles. Now the interesting thing about a, a robot such as this is that it has the mechanical musculature to be able to generate interesting behavior in a complex environment. In other words, it's not agency driven, it doesn't have a brain, uh, but uh, because of the complexity of the environment that it interacts with, it generates interesting behavior. Um, and then these more uncanny Boston Dynamic robots um, a dog-like robot with a mammalian gait, um, with a neck that can become an arm. Um, 
you may have seen uh, some of these. Uh, these are uh, quite recently. So what generates this sense of aliveness? We can see it's a robot, but the mammalian gait is, is, is very seductive and, and very uh, lifelike. And then another kind of hybrid machine, uh, which also has wheels, but uh, with also dynamic balance. It has a very small footprint, so it can manoeuvre, uh, but the simplicity of only having 10 actuated joints. Um, so we're going to increasingly see uh, these kinds of hybrid, um, sort of insect-like, machine-like, human-like um, uh, systems that perform increasingly in very athletic ways. And then uh, the Atlas humanoid robot that um, was recently on YouTube where this uh, robot can perform reliably and also produce this somersault, backward somersault, which uh, is quite impressive. So if you imagine this, uh, this uh, 75 kilogram robot um, coming towards you and performing with such speed and agility, um, yes, then we are producing robots with mechanical musculatures that will certainly, and, and also I have to say, um, Boston Dynamics has developed um, a, 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 a four-legged uh, robot that can uh, run faster than Usain Bolt. That's the speed that they're achieving. But there is a reason uh, perhaps to develop uh, humanoid-like robots. Um, this is David Hansen's robotic head and uh, with 32 micromotors embedded into the, into the soft skin, uh, they're able to generate very <coughs> convincing uh, facial expressions. Um, also, the, uh, the robot can lip-sync words so it can speak to its human interlocutor and it also has uh, uh, webcams for its eyes so it can follow your gaze, it can become effectively a surveillance system for someone else looking at you elsewhere. And <clears throat> there are several ideas with this. Uh, Nietzsche's idea that there's no being behind the doer, that it's, act it's in fact the action itself rather than the agency <coughs> that comes first. You, you act and then you attribute agency. Um, and Wittgenstein, who asserted that thinking does not uh, have to be located inside your head. Uh, in fact, thinking happens with the lips that you speak, with the hands that you write, with the fingers that you type. Um, we were talking this morning about uh, uh, just, just try to simply think. It really isn't possible. You don't get very far. It's only when you begin jotting down your thoughts that these ideas are actualized and you can reflect upon them and then further elaborate on them. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, thinking is a kind of mythology about, about uh, the human body. Uh, yes, there's electrical activity that's happening, but you're really not aware, you're not conscious of most of the thoughts that are supposed to be you know, in, happening inside your brain. Now, the interesting thing, too, about human-like robots is that, according to a Professor Mori in Japan, that um, as you make robots more and more human-like, they become more and more creepy. So, in other words, <clears throat> you know, they may look human, they may move in a human-like way, but they might twitch strangely, or they might have a metallic voice or, or something like that. Um, and now, is this a philosophical dilemma in constructing humanoid robots, or is it perhaps just a state-of-the-art problem, a state-of-the-art of technology problem? Um, I think it's really that, because being creepy is not only a robot problem. We know that there are creepy, we know that there are creepy people in the world. If I have a stammer, if I'm socially maladjusted, 
If I'm extremely shy, then I'm going to probably come across as being creepy too. Oh no, 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 I don't need water, no. I'm, I'm the first one to knock a glass of water or a cup of coffee over my computer. <laughs> we, can now, we can now make uh, instantly a hyper real skin. Uh, using a multiplicity of cameras or laser scanning a face, you can instantly make a skin that's hyper real. And if you would map a, a coordinates to that skin, if you would place morph targets on that skin, you would animate that skin. It's not, a, it's not, it's not an image, it's a digital object. Um, and so, in, in terms of a, of a screen, you would not know whether it's the artist at the other end or simply a, a, a programmed answering machine uh, featuring his, his hyper-real face. So what happens now? Skins <clears throat> become screens. Faces flatten onto screens. When we interact uh, over the net, when we're Skyping, uh, we're interacting with a flattened face at the other end. Um, and so images for me are no longer more or less what they seem, but rather they become much more than we can imagine. Digital entities uh, proliferate, replicate, and even now begin to contaminate the human and its microbiome. Image Metrics is a markerless performance driven animation company. We specialize in high quality facial animation for video games and films. With mocap, markers are placed all over an actor's face, and the actor is then required to perform in front of dozens of special cameras. With image metrics, however, there are no markers or special cameras. The actor's performance is simply recorded onto video, and the video is then analyzed by the proprietary computer vision software. Well, the actor is captured on video, and then the video is analyzed by our computer software, and the actor's performance is used to drive any facial rig. The client gets back, animation curves on the rig. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> well, I think that they have a long way to go. Mm, I've seen better. It sucks. Whew. I mean, really? Can, can we just skip that question? They really, really are bad. Not good. Terrible. Actually. Yeah. So I must say that when I first saw the video, I really didn't cotton on that it was not the real Emily and, and, until the very end. So. Increasingly now, you're able to generate quite convincing hyper-real avatars that are more and more subtle, more and more sophisticated uh, in their movements. And the next video clip is from uh, some research done by Mark Sagar at the University of Auckland. And uh, he made a, a 3D model of his uh, baby daughter uh, and basically is teaching it to recognize objects and to speak back to him. Okay, so here's baby X and this is, um, she's been learning to read words. So here's her first word book. So let's see what she can see. It's on her page. And here we go, let's see what she, what's this baby? What's this, what's this, what's this? Good girl, let's see if she knows what the word is. Okay, baby, look over here. Okay, what's this, what's this? Good girl. Right, let's try on something else. Okay. Let's try it back. Okay. What's this? Baby, baby, over here. What's this? Baby, look at me. Look at me. What's this? Baby, over here. Over here. Good girl. Well, that's what she's just reading. Let's see. Let's throw a picture. Okay, baby. What's this? What's this? 
Good. See if she can read the word too. Okay, let me, let me, what does this say? So this combination of, you know, neurophysiology and cognitive scientific um, uh, approaches, sort of generating a, a, a system that can learn by looking and uh, it's really just a, a, a camera and, and, um, and, and audio system. Um, and uh, they're teaching robots in this way as well. Uh, so if you, for example, as Asimo, the, the, the Honda robot, now is being taught by being shown, for example, a red apple. It can see it's red, it can see it's round, it can hold it, it can feel it. Uh, you take it away, you bring it back tomorrow, you ask it what this is, uh, it learns, it makes associations, um, it, it says it's an apple. So <clears throat> this idea is it's, it's very time intensive and it's maybe not the way that <clears throat> in the future you're going to uh, teach robots or, or avatars um, uh, uh, information, but it's very interesting as a, as a, as a, as a human experiment uh, that this can be applicable uh, to artificial entities. <clears throat> so skins as screens attain this optical and haptic thickness, and it's this thickening that collapses the psychological space uh, between bodies, between remote bodies. So it's no longer simply uh, a, a, a screen is no longer a membrane. It 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 has this optical uh, and haptic uh, thickness that um, is electronically it electronically amplifies and psychologically collapses uh, the space between bodies. So we now navigate from, from physical nanoscales to virtual non-places. The body inhabits this abstract realm of mediated subjectivity and the highly hypothetical. The body becomes this simultaneously possessed and performing body and it becomes this extruded operational system of flesh but also of, of its <coughs> flickering phantoms, of its digital doppelganger. So in this age of excess, we become end effectors for bodies elsewhere. In other words, we're potentially um, uh, 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 completing uh, um, tasks initiated from other places, liter literally. In 1993, um, uh, I was invited to <clears throat> participate in the uh, fifth Australian Sculpture Triennale, whose theme was site-specific works. <clears throat> but instead of a sculpture for a public space, I decided to design a sculpture for an internal body space. Um, so this object closes to safely be inserted down the esophagus into the stomach, and when it's fully inside the stomach, it opens and closes, extends and retracts, has a flashing light and a beeping sound. So you have to imagine this is a machine choreography occurring in a soft and wet part of the body. Uh, the stomach has, has to be inflated with air to make it safe to insert into. Um, and uh, it took uh, two days and six insertions to film about 15 uh, minutes of, of video. So the inverse of this project is an installation uh, titled Blender. Uh, this is in collaboration with another artist, uh, Nina Sellers. We both underwent a liposuction to extract uh, 4.6 litres of our biomaterial and uh, this um, biomaterial was uh, placed in this installation that we call Blender. Um, it's usually stored in my deep freeze <laughs> for safekeeping. Um, but you can see we're following all sorts of protocols to safely uh, handle the, the biomaterial. Um, and when this uh, uh, container is hermetically sealed, uh, 
the chassis of the installation contains an array of proximity sensors. If anyone approaches the installation, um, it sets off uh, the compressed air which actuates the blender blades which mixes the biomaterial from the two artist's bodies. So instead of a, a machine choreography inside a soft body, uh, this is a machine installation which is the host for a liquid body uh, containing biomaterial from the two artists' bodies. Uh, a project that uh, hasn't been realised either, but I show it because uh, Antero Kare, um, a, a Finnish artist, is also involved in this. It's a collaboration, in fact, to grow uh, uh, a skin, uh, a microbial architecture of skin, um, this would be done in a, in a customised, uh, life-scaled life uh, 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 incubator, uh, which would be uh, 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 um, sprayed with, with moisture to keep it humid, uh, kept at about 37 degrees centigrade. It would be a five-day uh, performance in which the skin would begin to grow, but would hardly be visible. It would be on some kind of a, a substrate, like silk, for example. Um, and then after the five days, the body would be extracted. The skin would be left behind because it would take some months, four, five, six months, for that microbial architecture to uh, be seen visibly in terms of some thickness and, and changes in colour. Uh, the ear project began in 1996, um, I guess as a counterpoint to the ear on the back of the mouse, which didn't last long by the way. Um, but the, uh, the ear here initially was meant to be an ear on the side of my head. Now this was an anatomically dumb place to have an extra ear. Uh, I couldn't get any surgical assistance to do it there. But in uh, 2006, with the help of um, uh, three plastic surgeons um, in Los Angeles, of all places, um, with uh, funding from a London production company, we began the first surgical procedures. Uh, the ear scaffold is made of a biomaterial that is um, highly porous. And when that uh, scaffold is inserted beneath the skin, when the skin is suctioned over the scaffold, over a period of six months, you get tissue ingrowth and vascularization occurring. So in other words, the ear becomes uh, integrated into your arm. Um, the cells grow into the scaffold. It grows its own blood supply. So it has now blood capillaries. It's still only a relief of an ear. I don't know if you see it. Uh, the light might be a bit too bright. Um, see it over there, have a closer look later. Um, but uh, I, I, I did get, get confirmation uh, last week that the stem cell researcher in uh, Spain is willing to do some stem cell work uh, using my pluripotent stem cells to grow a soft earlobe. Uh, what you're seeing here is um, uh, the, uh, a small microphone was inserted into the ear construct it's no longer there, but it was there for testing for, for two weeks. We wrapped um, the, the arm uh, in a partial plaster cast uh, with bandages. Even with the surgeon's face mask on, he could speak. The microphone inside the ear construct would pick up his voice and we could wirelessly transmit it. Um, so the idea really is not only, not only to replicate and relocate uh, a facial structure, but rather to rewire it and uh, to make it a re remote listening device for people in other places. In other words, internet enable the ear. This ear is not for me, I've got two good ears to hear with. Uh, this ear is for people um, elsewhere. So if I'm in Helsinki and you're in London, New York, wherever you are, wherever I am, you'll be able to log in and listen to what the ear is hearing. I showed my ear to my two-year-old niece and um, 
I was wondering whether she would recognize it, it was in fact an ear. And the first thing she did was, after she looked at the ear, she then took my head, turned it, to see if this one had slipped off. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I figured that she was trying to work out. <laughs> um, the Ear on Arm project has generated some other art, art events. This is a, a four metre long sculpture of the ear on my arm that um, we, lay, uh, we did by laser can uh, scanning, laser cutting. Uh, but I, uh, I was asked to do a performance at the Lawn Sculpture Triennale, so I simply lay on the sculpture. My body was smeared with white clay. Uh, because of the very cold day and my very warm body, uh, the clay cracks. So over the 45 minutes that the body was on there, it really was too cold to stay on, on there any longer, um, the, 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 the skin, the, the clay skin cracks. Uh, but really this was more about a, a counterpoint of scale. A whole body uh, lying on a much larger <laughs> fragment of a body um, with a, a near on its arm. But whilst I was lying on that sculpture, I thought, whoa, it would be really interesting <clears throat> if I could suspend my body and this was done in, <clears throat> excuse me, in 2012. So um, in this performance, I was lying on the sculpture. Um, 16 hooks were inserted, <clears throat> excuse me, into the back and the legs. Uh, when everything was rigged, I was winched up. <coughs> Going to the So when the steel cable, because it's braided, when it takes the full weight of the body, the steel cable begins to untwist. And as it untwists, the body begins to spin. Um, I knew this was going to happen from previous performances. Uh, the body spins in one direction, uh, speeds up, then slows down, spins in the other direction. I thought it would last for about five minutes. It actually lasted for about 15 minutes. Uh, this performance began when the body was hoisted off the sculpture and the performance ended when the body was lowered down. It had serendipitously stopped in, the, in approximately the same position as it was previously. A, a more recent performance uh, titled Propel and I've been really interested in, in, in industrial machinery before. In fact, I did a series of performances where a camera was uh, uh, attached to the end of the robot arm and we programmed the, the robot to be effectively uh, a cinematic uh, uh, device to produce scanning, panning, uh, zooming movements. <clears throat> but I'd always wanted to attach my body on, on the robot. It was very difficult to get permission to do this. Uh, because, uh, as you can imagine, this industrial robot is a rather dangerous uh, machine. In fact, ordinarily, you can't be closer than that fence ar around it. Um, so to convince the owners to let, my, uh, let me be attached uh, to the robot, um, the compromise I had to make in the end was I couldn't have it operating uh, at the lethal speed that it normally can. So it was fairly uh, a, a fairly gentle choreography, uh, but um, uh, which lasted about 30 minutes. Uh, the programming was done, <coughs> excuse me, using a simulation 3D modeling program. So we could program the robot uh, and see what it was gonna do. And then, as well as that, we could, uh, before I got on the robot, we connected a heavy weight uh, equivalent to my body. And after my body was finished, we, uh, <laughs> we <laughs> detached my body and uh, uh, a full scale, a body scaled uh, sculpture of uh, my ear uh, replaced me and the same choreography was performed. 
The interesting thing was that the robot that choreographs uh, the ear is the same robot that carved the ear. Uh, the robot effectively was a six degree of freedom uh, CNC machine. Um, whilst I was um, performing this, I was very, very intrigued about the, the minimal aluminium support structure that allowed me to be attached to the robot. And when I saw the video, uh, when I saw the back of my body on the robot and saw this beautiful stick-like minimal support structure, I thought, wow, this would be a very beautiful, minimal, uh, full-body exoskeleton. So stick man effectively is um, uh, uh, an algorithmically actuated system. So uh, at the moment, um, we use Markov chains. So once you set the parameters, the system selects the different movements that you make. Uh, you don't know what these movements are going to be. Um, although uh, my two arms and one leg were choreographed, I could pivot on my free leg and then I could uh, manipulate my shadow or the video feedback that was projected uh, on the screen. So there was this interplay of involuntary choreography, but also uh, trying to uh, aesthetically, intentionally play with the shadows and the video uh, feedback. And this is the performance that Nicolina alluded to before, where <clears throat> for five days, uh, six hours a day, um, I could only see with the eyes of someone in London, I could only hear with the ears of someone in New York, but anyone anywhere could access my arm through the exoskeleton and remote control it. So my vision was disconnected from my hearing, my arm effectively was disconnected from my body, or the other way of seeing it is that your senses are outsourced to people in other places. Your agency is shared by people in other places. The performance I'm going to show though is the more recent iteration of this, which was for four days, uh, six hours a day. Uh, it was in Eindhoven, between Eindhoven, uh, Basel and Antwerp. So there's a bit of German happening. <laughs> So of course I didn't know what I was going to hear, I didn't know what I was going to see. It depended on the person streaming uh, video uh, in, 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 in Antwerp or streaming audio from Basel. Uh, and that's streaming too. 
So we know now that we can 3D print using living cells. And if we can 3D print using living cells, if we can grow organs using stem cell, pluripotent stem cells, uh, then there will be an excess of organs, of organs awaiting bodies, of organs without bodies. So in this age of body hacking, gene mapping, prosthetic augmentation, organ swapping, face transplants, synthetic skin, and, com and lab chimeras, what it means to be a body, what it means to be human, and what generates aliveness and agency becomes problematic. So in these liminal spaces of proliferating prosthetic bodies, partial life and artificial life, the body has become this kind of floating signifier. It can become any body that we can imagine. Uh, we can now remote control insects by embedding an eight chip uh, uh, um, a circuit in their brain. Um, we can grow bits of human liver in lab mice and do pha pharmacological experiments, safe pharmacological experiments on them. Um, nano nanobots can be actuated by bacteria stuck to their chassis. So that's the scale that uh, it's, it's on, a, on a bacterial scale that these nano machines are being made. And also, skin cells now can be taken from an impotent male and converted into sperm cells. And more interestingly, skin cells can be taken from a female body and be turned into sperm cells. <laughs> so, males are out of the reproductive loop. But one, one bit of technology that, I, that I've been using recently as an example of how um, sort of significantly uh, a technology can alter a human body is uh, the twin turbine heart. So in 2011, uh, the first twin turbine heart, which is smaller, more robust, more reliable than previous artificial hearts, was inserted into the chest of a terminally ill patient. He lived long enough for them to, to test the, the, uh, the twin turbine heart. And what's interesting about the turbine heart is that it circulates the blood without pulsing. So in the near future, you could rest your head on your loved one's chest. They're warm to the touch. They're breathing. They're speaking. They're certainly alive. They have no heartbeat. Um, and now... Uh, seeing if someone is alive or dead by feeling their pulse is no longer plausible. Um, it also erases thousands of years of references to the heart as a, a romantic organ, for example. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's a technology that kind of radically uh, asks questions about what a body is. And I think what artists do best is generate these contestable futures. Uh, possibilities that can be um, engineered, uh, experienced, possibly appropriated, but most likely discarded. Um, it's not about um, uh, a predictable future. Uh, contingency is always a part of any, any future outcome. Um, so the idea of artists generating contestable futures, I think, is a, is a very important one. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you so much, Stellar, for your talk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we'll we'll have questions. Good. Got it. Okay. Uh, question. Yes. Yes. Okay.
Yes, thank you so much uh, for your art talk. Uh, I'm Tommy Humalis, the, the professor of flight and design. Um, uh, I, I was wondering, like, how, how do you see uh, the element of control uh, as a part of your like um, artistic thinking? Because it seems to me that there is this very strong this element of, of like partly controlling a lot of things and and then uh, having this like non-control. Yeah. Oh, I, I think I think with most of these projects and performances, they, you know, in a way, problematize um, this issue of of being in control. Um, I mean, uh, in our traditional robotics, we talk about master-slave mechanism. You know, the human activates, actuates, and then the machine kind of mimics. Um, but but in a complex interactive system. Uh, for example, Marvin Minsky talks about telepresence. So if a robot is, is in one place and you're in another place uh, and you can see what the robot sees and, and the robot does what you want it to do, uh, it's kind of, in effect, you're telepresent where the robot is because you're, you're seeing through the eyes of the robot. Um, Susumi Tachi, a professor of robotics in, in Japan, goes a step further. He calls his idea not telepresence, but tele-existence. In other words, if the feedback loops between the robot and the, and the human body are adequate, uh, sophisticated, subtle enough, then and, and what you see is what the robot sees, and what you do is what the robot does, and there's no lag in, 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 in you know, executing each other, then, uh, or perhaps that you're in half control of the robot and the robot provides force, speed, force feedback back to you so you can kind of feel um, you know, resistance or, or not, um, then effectively you are the robot. You, know, you become the end effector. Uh, like uh, my fingertip is the end effector of my brain. It's uh, you know, a meter, over a meter away from my brain. It takes um, you know, 50 milliseconds or something for the signal to go to my brain being processed and for me to kind of feel something. So, um, you know, instead of thinking of the end of your finger as, as being the end effector, think of a robot elsewhere if adequate feedback loops are, are generated. So um, it's, it's interesting. And there's other interesting concept involved in this because to get over the problem of lag because if a robot is on Mars, for example, it's going to take a lot of time before a signal from you is going to reach the robot and come back. So <clears throat> they do what's called forward masking, uh, where through a, a virtual interface, through a 3D model, uh, you can perform the action, you can see what the 3D model is doing, and then you're assuming that the, the robot at the other end is going to be performing in, in, in an adequate way. Of course, something unpredictable might happen, but in those kinds of environments, uh, nothing happens very quickly, you know. Um, so uh, I think that's an interesting one. And the other interesting concept is intelligent disobedience. Because if you send a signal to the robot, <clears throat> and by the time the signal gets to it, uh, something might have changed, you know. Some, the circumstances might have changed. The robot should have or should be able to have intelligent disobedience. Like a guide dog, you know, uh, you, you know, the blind person wants to cross the road, but the blind dog will stop if, if there are cars coming. Um, so those two concepts, I think, are really interesting. Forward masking, which is in fact what we do in the real world. Um, I, I, I don't touch something uh, red because it might be hot, and I have the experience that it is hot, and so uh, this expectation is, is what generates the, the kind of forward masking that we do. It, it involves a kind of an anticipation of something uh, that, ha that may not have already happened. I haven't burnt my finger yet, but I know from experience if I do touch this surface, I, I, might, I might scold my finger. So uh, forward masking and intelligent disobedience are two concepts that would need to be integral in, in, in any teleoperational, tele-existent system. The questions, yes. Hi, I'm Vishnu. 
my question is I want to know the discovery of your pain threshold. How did you discover it? Uh, I'm sorry, how? How did you discover your pain threshold? Oh, my pain. <laughs> <laughs> Gradually, <laughs> um, yeah. No, it's sort of um, it's interesting because pain was never a subject of the performances. So I didn't do a performance to have a painful experience. Uh, you don't get pregnant to have a painful experience. I mean, it is painful, but that's not the reason why, say, someone gets pregnant. Um, so uh, uh, it happened gradually when I began to do. Um, uh, uh, not only internal probes of my body, but also a sensory deprivation. So, for example, the performance I did just before the first suspension event involved uh, stitching my lips and eyelids shut with surgical needle and thread, and uh, I, I stitched also my eyelids shut. And uh, I had two hooks into my back, tethering me to the gallery wall. And uh, for one week, I didn't speak, I didn't see, I didn't eat, I didn't drink, and I was very cold. It was about 10 degrees in the gallery. Um, so uh, so, so they, they kind of happened incrementally, gradually. Um, but, you know, I'm a coward in a dentist chair. You know? So I think if, 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 you, if you're, in a sense, um, if you act, you know, if you plan the performance and you allow it to happen and I guess the word that I use is to perform with indifference being indifferent uh, normally this is a negative word in in English or connotes something negative but um, I mean by indifference being opposed to expectation the opposite of expectation so you have no expectations you allow the performance to kind of unfold in its own time, with its own rhythm. You allow things to happen to you. So that's the approach that's taken. There, one of the things that um, I know, so it seems slightly discontinuous, is, <laughs> it, it, is that um, on the one hand, your your work merges with daily life and 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 concepts of daily life and 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 living like in, like the the one you just mentioned. And others, your 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 durational works, but but on the other hand, you have a it start the performance starts when it's turned on. I mean, you, you said this a number of times. It stops when it's turned off. What what is it that what 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 do you call that uh, period when you are constructing the the uh, scenario or constructing or planning the performance or or preparing yourself for that performance and and why is it that that to you is not also performance you have a you have a quite formalistic notion of the start stop uh, so i'm curious about that yeah i guess so well firstly i'm not so interested in process <laughs> that might be a surprise to some but um really everything le leads to an outcome so it's the body suspended in different positions in various locations, uh, sometimes static, sometimes moving through the, through the space. Um, I'm not really interested in the process of inserting 18 hooks into the skin, stuff like that. Um, so it's more about outcome rather than process in this case. Uh, certainly the performances are, are kind of aesthetically framed in the sense that it's difficult to avoid, um, you know, a history of of, um, of f figurative nudes and you know that that kind of history of the of the naked body, for example. Um, so, and I also want to emphasise that uh, there's nothing um, there's nothing there's no transcendental impulse in these. You know, the body is the same before it does a performance, it's the same during the performance, and it's the same after the performance. This idea of sort of altered states doesn't come into it. There's no sort of yogic, shamanistic, or other kinds of um, pseudo-spiritual pursuits. 
the body is an object, uh, a, a sculptural stretching of the skin occurs when it's suspended, uh, and it has relationships with other objects and other uh, other sort of elements in, in the installation. So I, 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 I generally describe my performances as body installations if I have a choice rather than uh, a performance because um, even though I might insist on a stop start I don't see them in a kind of a theatrical sense. Thank you. Taking all that into account, I'm still curious about what goes on in your head. What are you thinking of <laughs> during the performances? Yeah. Like, yeah, you know, you know, uh, thinking isn't. Um, uh, there, there's uh, there's another. I think it's another Nietzschean statement that there's a point in time when thinking stops, and and the action unfolds or the action begins um, you it's more an experience rather than <coughs> you know your ref, you know your thinking um, so it's more uh, like for example uh, with the Copenhagen suspension my body was suspended almost 60 meters high above the Royal Theatre in Copenhagen and in that performance after about 30 meters all I could hear was the whooshing of the wind, the whirring of the crane motors, and the creaking of the skin. <laughs> so you kind of listen and experience, and it's more about, you know, in, in, in intensities, trajectories, it, rather than, oh, I'm up here, I, what am I thinking about, you know? I probably think uh, that it was very foolish if I really started to <laughs> evaluate. Well, actually, what was really what was really embarrassing what was really embarrassing uh, the New York suspension when I was suspended above the street. Uh, when I was looking down, I, I realised that people were looking up. <laughs> 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 you know, if you're a shy person like me. <laughs> okay, um, this morning you talked uh, about your stay in Japan and your influence in Budo. Yes. And I would like to ask you to expand it a little bit because I, um, I think it's quite relevant yeah. now that I see your work again. Yeah, I mean, um, I didn't mean so much that, uh, you know, I appropriated Bhutto techniques into my work, but um, I mentioned in the workshop this morning that when I went to Japan, I lived in Japan for about 19 years, and I, I went there soon after art school finished. Um, but the three influences uh, were sumo wrestling, uh, Buto dance and uh, the robots, Japanese robotics, um, and, and so it was a combination of those those three things that were really intriguing. Seeing these big bodies, these big, massive objects colliding, you know, into into one another, full force, but then performing these delicate rituals, throwing salt and you know doing stuff like that. Um, uh, seeing Bhutto uh, was uh, an instance whereby uh, these bodies were uh, erased of identity. Uh, they were moving in s seemingly strange ways. Um, the Sankai Juko uh, um, uh, uh, video that I showed, um, when when they were moving on their haunches. Uh, I don't know if you noticed that the toes and the feet were curled uh, inwards. Um, so it was almost like in, in, insect-like movement, animal-like movement. So I was really attracted 
and seduced by, by this sort of unexpected way the body moved in, in Bhutto. And of course in robotics, uh, I mean, in the West we have a kind of a Frankensteinian fear that robots will take over, you know, that we're creating, you know, these monstrous machines and stuff like that. Uh, in Japan there seems to be a much uh, more convivial relationship with machines uh, and robots are proliferating uh, sort of and, and being socially incorporated um, uh, uh, much quicker there. And the other thing that I talked about that you prompted to is um, the love, Japanese love dolls. Mm -hmm. As opposed to humanoid robots that might move their arms, uh, walk, uh, 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 attempt to speak, Japanese love dolls, they're beautifully crafted, silicon, full-size figures, right? Um, and when a Japanese person uh, buys a, a love doll, they kind of, uh, it's not so much that they buy it, but they, they kind of marry it. Uh, the idea is that you groom the, the, the doll, you, you, you bathe it, you, 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 know, you interact with it, uh, it's there as a physical presence, it doesn't move, it doesn't speak. I mean, sometimes this might be an advantage in a relationship. <laughs> uh, 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 genitalia uh, are optional extras. Um, and often it's not only the geeky uh, uh, loner who has a Japanese love doll, um, it's the Japanese husband who, who buys a love doll and you get this awkward threesome happening uh, between the wife, the husband, and, and, the, and, and the love doll. Uh, so uh, what was, uh, I, I guess, a little bit more disturbing when I uh, heard about the Japanese love dolls is that there is one sort of Japanese craftsman who makes uh, children uh, to manage his pedophilia. <coughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, no one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I still uh, would uh, love to hear something from how, how you how you experience it from the inside, especially when um, when you tell uh, you get the visual input from New York, you get the audio input from uh, Basel, and yeah. and still something is happening with your with your uh, arm. Yeah. How do you manage to, how do you keep yourself together? That's the yeah. <laughs> I think with that performance, what was, uh, what ended up being the difficult uh, aspect of the performance was, um, one, one difficulty was when my arm was um, remotely activated, uh, it throws, throws me a little off balance and I have to kind of, you know, retain my balance. N not too difficult, but you know that 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 was sort of a little unexpected. And then the other unexpected thing was if I'm uh, if I'm seeing what someone else is seeing, and they're on their bicycle yeah. riding through London, or I'm on the top of a double decker bus, then uh, and this the bus is moving, uh, then it's uh, yeah it's 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 very uh, uh, you know you've got to try to retain your balance and and. Uh, Th that that was that was a, a little bit difficult, but in, in a way you just kind of allow your body to 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 experience um, you know disconnected images, disconnected sounds, and disconnected parts of your body. It's more you know what does it feel like to be partly machinic in your movements and partly uh, uh, you know seeing and hearing. I mean, there was one one time I was in the the Tate Modern, and uh, I was listening to a discussion in a Chinese restaurant. And my friend, the musician who was who was streaming, he was speaking into my it was stereo. He was streaming into my left ear, so I was hearing his voice. I was hearing his his wife's Nina's voice in my right ear, and I heard a Japanese uh, a Chinese voice. Uh, another person sitting with them, uh, you know, having lunch, and so you you're kind of immersed in in this kind of uh, acoustical 
uh, uh, conversation, a stream of, 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 of conversations. Um, so, but I think what tended to happen was, if if the if the sound was more interesting, you tended to kind of uh, your attention sort of slid to the to the sound. If if the vision was more interesting, you know, you tended to to kind of focus on 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 on, on the imagery. Um, so, you know, and, and so your your eyes are elsewhere, your ears are somewhere else. But when your body moves and you're thrown off balance, you're you're here. <laughs> yeah. So you're partly locally uh, uh, positioned, uh, but also kind of remotely outsourced. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I want to ask about uh, how do you think about the audience? What, what's your relationship? Like you've mentioned that you think about the body as a sculpture, but, but do you, uh, like how, what do you think about the audience? What are your yeah. relationships with? Well, um, with, with, the, with the suspension performances, aside from um, Copenhagen and New York, and maybe another couple, almost all of the other suspensions were done in remote locations or in private gallery spaces where the only people there were the people assisting. And at the time, in the 70s and 80s, you could still get arrested for doing that sort of stuff. You know? So um, a lot of it was done in private. Um, in the recent performances with the robotics and with this, then the, the audience is kind of, uh, we streamed live to the internet and people on the net could remotely activate my body. Yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> if you go to my website, um, uh, stellart.org slash rewired, uh, you should be able to get on the website and remote control the arm in Paris at the moment. It's only an interactive installation, but, um, you know, you could do that. Um, so when my body gets out of the... The, the, the interactive system, then the arm is, stays behind for the rest of the exhibition. There's a touch screen in the gallery, um, and the project, typically a projection of the performance is left behind as well. So there's a kind of a, a visual and interactive trace left behind. Uh, so, yeah, the audience, I, it's never been uh, the major concern. I mean, in a sense, the audience is, is, is considered incidental. You're not performing for an audience. You're happy if an audience comes, um, you know, or the situation enables an audience to see it, but it's going to happen with or without an audience. Oh, one one um, other issue is uh, ethics, not, not so much in the ethics of of um, whether robots will take over or this this kind of thing, but but the use the, the human disuse or misuse of robotics um, uh, because you show Boston Dynamics, which makes military robots, uh, and 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 that's why they're so effective. I mean, and that and that's their motivation is to make them into killing machines. Um, do you have any? concerns about your work being exploited or inspirational to um, you know the military industrial complex uh, not my work no <laughs> <laughs> no I, I know that you yeah. you have humanist um, you know uh, motivations no, no. but but no. not everybody does yeah, but none, yeah. none of my yeah. none of my projects are utilitarian enough or sophisticated enough um, we were talking today about um, you know, art and technology and, and uh, you know artists don't usually get access to really sophisticated technology um, you know if, if you if you work for Boston Dynamics or, or Google you know there's millions of dollars uh, being spent with large teams of programmers and engineers I mean all an artist can do is 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 a, a creative gesture uh, that uh, sometimes messes with the technology um, but rarely does an artist do anything sophisticated enough. In fact, we were talking also about the problem with this kind of mixing or 
this misleading mixture of art and science, which is a paradigm that everyone seems to operate now. Um, I mean, you don't want uh, artists in lab coats doing r bad research, and you don't want scientists doing bad art, but that's increasingly happening. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, we shouldn't, no, no, but we shouldn't, we shouldn't, it's not belittling science, it's just that I think the methodologies of scientific practice um, and artistic pursuits are very different, you know. You can make great art and be a dumb artist, you know. Stupidity doesn't, uh, you know, dismiss you from a, making a great work of art. Um, artists can do something very quickly, they can do it overnight. They can drip and dribble paint on a canvas on the floor and make an, a masterpiece. Um, you know, a scientist, typically, uh, they're doing research over a number of years, um, methodically, reductively, uh, generally for some utilitarian outcome, or an iteration of a quantum mechanical model that might be a better quantum mechanical model. Uh, so, I think we, ha we need to be careful in, in that aspect. Certainly, artists use technology, but they use it and mess with it, uh, and, and, and experiment and do things that scientists wouldn't do with that technology, for example. And also, it's not enough to have an idea. An idea is easy. Anyone can have an idea. Uh, to actualize the idea, to perform the idea, is what's, uh, what's important. Um, and so, you know, if an artist is messing uh, with, you know, with scientific phenomena, um, in, in the end, unless they can produce a work that has some kind of impact, some kind of visceral feel to it, um, simplistically I would say that art is more about effect, affect, <coughs> affect, affect, <laughs> and um, when I said it no one understood before. <laughs> Art is more about affect, and, <laughs> and science is more about information. I know it's a simplistic generalisation, but yeah, science is, science is more about accumulating information. Art is more about uh, generating experiences of affect. It's really hard to say it that way. <laughs> Do you say it that way? Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's maybe a bad Australian. Um, hello, sir. Good evening. Thank you for for your um, presentation. And um, now that you're talking about methods, um, it's 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 this is more of 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 a, of a reflection on on your your art, your your um, doings. Um, you have been constantly. Uh, mentioning about counterpoint, counter counterpointing, pointing. Yeah. and I think um, that could be a method that you are using. For example, you've installed an ear on your arm, and then eventually made a sculpture of that image of an ear on your arm, and then also you've put your whole body on top of this sculpture of your arm with this installed ear. So I think, and, and this final words that you're, you're fi you finished your, your presentation with, it, your contestable futures, yeah. Yeah. This, this constant contestations of, of the human body versus the mechanical <coughs> body yeah. And this counterpointing, I think this traversing between the 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 how do you say biological and the mechanical yeah. technology versus human intellect is 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 pressing yeah. and will always be relevant. I would say, and I mean that that is for me coming from an artist who works with heavily with with biological bodies uh -huh. in a way. Yeah, and somehow I don't. Uh, th there were there were par parts in your presentation when when I felt that 
when you were working with machines, you've removed yourself as well, totally in the human aspect. You're like, okay, I'm doing this with machines and I'm not giving a damn about other bodies, if they're here or not. But somehow I understand. Yeah, this is more of my thoughts. Yeah, yeah. I think the word counterpoint is a, is a good word. Um, it's not necessarily in opposition. Um, I think counterpoint is, is a more pertinent description. Um, I, 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 on the other hand, I, I think what it means to be human is what it means to uh, construct artifacts, engineer interfaces, instruments, machines. So, you know, technology is not the alien other. Uh, technology is what, you know, sort of generates what it means to be human. So, um, so, so I see uh, more a kind of a hybridization, uh, you know, of technology with the body uh, that occurs incrementally to the point where you blur the distinction between the two and it's meaningless to make a distinction anymore. Um, but yeah, in terms of uh, performing, I think counterpoint is, 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 a, is, a, good, is a good description. A and I like to use the word in inverse as well, so referring to blender, uh, as the inverse to uh, the stomach sculpture. It, it wasn't deliberately done that way, but uh, it, it, it turned out to be a, an apt description of it. Okay, hello, and thank you, here. Oh, yes. Okay. So I was thinking uh, the relationship, uh, your body and your kind of identity, or me, uh, that uh, you are kind of pushing uh, the boundaries of the body, like I was thinking flying, like the dream of uh, flying or a body being in the same time uh, in the different places. So do you have some kind of dream of your body, what it could do that uh, it's not now possible maybe when we are just uh, uh, without the technology or... Um. No, I, I mean, the, the way that I, I sort of operate as an artist is that, you know, generally one performance uh, kind of triggers an iteration. Um, one performance contributes to the next one. So, so once you begin this process of performing and making art, it, you tend to kind of appropriate, incorporate from previous works and something kind of unfolds in that way. Um, I wasn't sure exactly uh, understanding your question but in, in terms of um, the body's identity um, I would say essentially that it's uh, socially constructed, uh, culturally conditioned um, and it's a it's, a, it's an identity of a body at this point in time in, in history. Um, yeah, maybe. You know, you're given a name and, and you, uh, uh, you develop into a, a role that you play in, in, in a career or in an artistic pursuit. And then that sort of, in a sense, generates that identity that even though you might change a little bit in appearance, uh, you know, yeah, you maybe retain. it was uh, maybe about a little bit uh, about the pain and uh, experience and uh, uh, sometimes you uh, talk about the body and sometimes you talk about you. Ah, uh, uh, yeah, now that's... Feeling, yeah, yeah. That, uh, is it just uh, a tool or how yourself is uh, conscious? No, I think, I, think, um, I think it's really a problem of language because <clears throat> language encourages us to speak as a subject. And so sometimes this body will slip into speaking as a subject uh, because it's convenient. It's convenient to do so. You know, um, the word I uh, really means this body in relationship to all these other bodies at this point in time in history, in this particular you know, educational institution in Finland 
you know. But it's too uh, it's too difficult to to kind of be so precise about who this body is. So you just say I. Uh, that I simply designates this body. You designates that body. Um, but the the feeling is that what's important is not inside you or me. What's important is what happens between bodies. Um, in the medium of language within which we're communicating. So that's what's really, really important. Hi, uh, I have a question about um, how do you see your work in relation to disability? Because I was wondering... Oh, to disability, yeah. Yeah, because I was wondering that the, the body seems to be a very able body because it's able to challenge itself, like, yeah. with, you know, with the pain and with yeah. the distractions and with technology, but how are you seeing it in relation to like people who actually need technology because of their disabilities? Or have you had any interaction with, with their disabilities? Yeah, I have. I've been invited to several sort of disability events and conferences and, and been on panels <coughs> with people um, who are sort of differently enabled in, 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 in either sight or, or mobility. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a fully enabled body that's performing in excess. You know, it's a third hand, it's an extra ear, it's an extended arm, it's a six-legged walking machine. Um, yes, I'm not disabled in any way that I require these in a, in a kind of a functional sense. It's an aesthetic choice to consider, an, you know, anatomical architectures that um, incorporate additional components. I guess because um, there's a feeling that this body or with this form and these functions is, is inadequate. Um, I have to gasp for air continuously. If my heart stops beating, I'm in trouble. I'm probably dead. If I lose 10% of my body fluids, I'm also dead. Um, if, I, if my internal temperature varies three or four degrees, I'm in serious health risk. Um, so, bodies live an average age of 80 years in good health. It's a problem if you're already 72. <laughs> so, uh, so, it depends how we frame things. Um, but uh, I, I, of course, I'm very interested in in the in the sort of interfaces and devices that have been engineered, uh, you know, for the disabled to allow them to speak or to see or to um, or, or to move. And sometimes I'm I'm envious. Uh, but um, and and one can argue that if you want cyborgian constructs to study. Uh, study people on life support systems or the disabled. They're probably going to be the, the most cyborgian uh, of, of, of our population. They're going to have things implanted, uh, things attached. Um, uh, 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 um, or one thing that I just remembered <clears throat> in this outsourcing of senses and the kind of rewired idea, rewiring the body, Imagine a synesthesia that's experienced uh, not from within the wiring of your body, but a synesthesia that's experienced by cross-wiring um, uh, senses from other bodies in other places. <laughs> that would be interesting. <laughs> do, do you find, okay, uh, at 72, do you find that, that your view of your work is changing? Uh, and and um, um, uh, yes, yes, yeah. and the, the the quick answer to that is I'm increasingly getting more questions about, about what will you do dead. with your body when you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> Join, joining Minsky and others who are cryogenically waiting for the the next millennium. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I don't. I'm not so interested in that. Maybe plastinated on, a, on an industrial robot arm. Mm. <laughs> In the Pompidou or. <laughs> <laughs>
but but uh, experientially, um, you know, and emotionally, uh, do you find that your approach to your work is changing? Um, up until this point, no. Um, I, I mean, really, I stopped uh, the suspension events in 1989 initially because I thought I'd just simply exhausted all of the aesthetic possibilities. I'd done 27, 28 suspension performances in different situations, various locations, um, in different positions and orientations. Um, so, you know, uh, but then in 2012 I decided to do another one. It was the same, I felt the same, uh, I managed, to, to, you know, to, 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 to complete the performance. So up until now, um, I, I, I see no problem, but, yeah, I mean, we know that the body is going to deteriorate, it's going to fatigue more often, um, and there's going to be problems, certainly. Um, so at that point, I guess you decide whether you stop performing altogether or you perform in different ways. I think Merce Cun Cunningham, for example, uh, performed at quite, a, at quite a good age. Um, you know, artists like Picasso were very active in, into their 90s. Um, so, yeah, it's d depending on what you want to do uh, realistically, uh, th there are going to be problems, physical limits and so on. But Work, Working with entropy. Yeah, I mean, it's just not something that I've thought about, actually, up until now. <laughs> but thanks for, <laughs> thanks for <laughs> putting the idea in my head. Actually, what was, what was most disconcerting was in the Paris Metro, and I got on the on the metro, and I had a heavy bag and my laptop, and I got on the on the on, on the on the train, and uh, a very sweet teenage girl stood up for me <laughs> <laughs> to give me her seat. <laughs> so, so yeah, you have to worry when when people, um, you know. I think about um, after the age of about forty, uh, the impression that you have of yourself and your physical, actual condition and appearance begin to dive, you know, begin to diverge, you know. So for a long time you maintain a, a useful internal kind of image of yourself, but of course, you know, your body doesn't look that way anymore, um, and, uh, and, and yeah, you begin to, to yeah, malfunction in some ways or, you know, What's your name again? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think we have time for one more, one more question. Oh, okay. We met the first time in yeah. 1994. Yes, uh, that's... Uh, <laughs> I'm just uh, continuing from that, uh, that uh, what is your... Damn. <laughs> uh, how your production has developed, or, or is it still the same? And I see that there is two different kind of uh, proceeds in your production. There is the third hand and uh, body as a system. But actually, I'm more interested in your uh, ear project. The ear project. Because uh, I'm interested nowadays more like uh, about consciousness, and nobody actually knows what consciousness is, no. how it works, and how it produce, produces itself, even we have, you know, we have put theories of that during the centuries. But uh, lately, researchers are more and more thinking that uh, consciousness is in different body parts. It, it works like a system. And I'm thinking about your ear, which is now placed in your hand, that uh, is that kind of body, uh, that kind of body part, which is growing inside of you, a new one? Is it a kind of you know when it's adapting to your body system? Is it also creating a kind of new consciousness also during the, during the time? I don't know. Maybe that yeah. that's a kind of artistic yeah. gesture. What yeah. you were talking about? Yeah. I don't know. Um, I don't know if you, uh, do you know uh, the theorist uh, Jean-Luc Nancy? Yeah. Um, he had a, a heart transplant and he wrote a, a beautiful book about uh, 
his feelings about about uh, this kind of stranger, this this uh, this this other part of that that is not him. That you know, I I I, um, I, I haven't thought of it in, in that way at all. Um, partly because uh, I just don't see. Um, this as kind of abnormal or or in any way uh, uh, an alien object on my arm. I mean sometimes in the evening you're sitting down you know on the couch and, and under the right light you know it, it really looks like an ear <laughs> um, and we are gonna uh, grow a soft earlobe using my adult stem cells now this project began in 1996 and it's still not completed. Um, I'm hoping that I, I was at a, a, a body uh, a hacking conference in Austin, Texas earlier this year and I was able to meet uh, some, some of the people in, the, in what's called the Grinder community. Uh, grinders are body hackers basically. And um, I've been communic they got in touch uh, earlier to invite me to give a talk there and and then we got, got discussing about the EAR project not being completed. And so um, I actually met them in Austin and talked to them in person. And we may be able to get this EAR uh, wired up uh, early next year, March or April. Um, so we're developing a, a chipset, uh, not only incorporating a microphone, but a GPS and a tilt sensor. So potentially the ear will be able to recognise a gesture or a, the position of your arm. Um, so I haven't figured out what the best use of that is or whether it's just uh, an aesthetic modulation of, of, a, of, a, of a sound, whatever. But uh, the chipset uh, at the moment is quite a, a, a cumbersome two centimetre square, five millimetre thick that's quite a chunky bit of chip. Uh, but we discussed the possibility of making a longer chip, uh, and it, but it, which will be flatter. A a and so in that way, we can spread the components in a linear fashion. And we've already tested uh, LEDs beneath the skin. So for example, if the ear is functioning, if something's being transmitted, you might have a flickering LED happening um, subdermally, and but that's okay. I mean, LEDs are cold light supply, so that you know could happen early next year. But you know, it's a it's been a long time, and it's frustrating that uh, you know you have certain hopes and expectations, and then people drop out, or they think it's too hard after discussing stuff with them for, for several years and so it's just been a prolonged... I, I have to say that if I had tried to surgically construct the ear in 1996 when the idea first uh, came, um, it probably would not have been done as well as it is now. And uh, had I tried to implant a chip uh, in 2006, it would have been you know, a very clumsy sort of effort. So, um, yeah, may maybe because it's taken time, I'll be able to um, make it uh, relatively sophisticated. Having said that, there's no guarantee how long it'll, it'll function. I'm hoping that it'll function a long time. It might be a week, it might be a month. <coughs> we can charge batteries externally, that's not a problem. The problem is sometimes uh, batteries do sort of explode. By exploding, I don't mean, you know, <coughs> but you know, we've had that experience of uh, mobile phones, <coughs> and uh, if that happens, you get, uh, you know, a strong uh, you know, heat and, and uh, the battery break cracks, and so that's not good. Uh, so, but that, you know, there's always a little risk in these things, so uh, that, that's, that's the situation as it is at the moment. Well, thank you to this mouth and this ear, to speaking to our ears, and, and this sometimes subject, uh, uh, named Stellark. 
Uh, thank you very much for your generosity in, in speaking with us and answering our questions. Thanks very much.